I wanted to talk to you just quickly about red meat because I mm. do think this is mm. one that you've done, I'd say, the best job at covering in terms of the question around just purely health. Mm-hmm. I think Lane Norton maybe has a bit of a, a different view on it, slightly different take from what I've heard. Mm-hmm. Don't want to misrepresent, but I, I think that he he thinks most of the effects of a high red meat diet being associated with, say, cardiovascular disease or colorectal cancer is driven by the fact that those diets tend to be lower in fiber, mm-hmm. plant matter, fruits and vegetables, mm-hmm. and, and therefore there is, say, confounders in this, in this data that mm-hmm. could better explain what, you, what we're seeing. Mm-hmm. You've, you're across that. And I think you would point mainly to the study out of Canada, the, yeah, Al- the Alberta, Alberta tomorrow, yeah. study to, to show that if you Eat sort of account for that, vegetable intake. then yeah. you see the effect size disappear or lessen. I guess just for people that are intrigued by this, if we're talking just unprocessed red meat, Mm -hmm. what's your view on health, exposure Mm -hmm. level, the current science that exists? Yeah, so for unprocessed red meat, we have a scenario where depending on the levels of intake in a cohort, you can either see, and the population, you can either see no real increase in heart disease or otherwise other outcomes. You might even see a little bit of a decrease if it's populations that consume low levels, particularly in women. It may relate to things like increased iron status or otherwise. That's usually in Asian populations. And then you will and can see increased risk at higher levels of intake, daily levels of intake. And you can also see that across populations. And this becomes really important. So the threshold of intake in any given cohort for unprocessed meat really matters to the analysis. The covariates that are potential confounders, I'm less concerned about because in robust, well-conducted prospective cohort studies, those factors are largely adjusted for in analysis. Body weight, smoking, exercise level, otherwise history, family history of Mm. cardiovascular disease. Now, Fiber? Fiber, yeah, Yeah. vegetables, fruit. I'll come to the Alberta men's tomorrow study anyway, specifically. But one point to make is that statistical adjustment is statistical adjustment. It's not wiping out the fact that someone Mm. smoked 20 a day for 40 years. Statistical adjustment is taking the, the average effect of that particular exposure over that cohort Mm. and basically adding it into a model to see whether at any li- level of that covariate, the association between your exposure, red meat, and your outcome, heart disease, actually changes. So just quickly, just on that to pause, because yeah. I think that sometimes people might get confused by that whole yes. multivariate adjustment thing. So like people are familiar with randomized controlled trials. Mm-hmm. So a randomization, mm-hmm. the, the, I guess one of the primary purposes of that is mm-hmm. you take a big group of people, yeah. split them up into say two groups, yeah. and you're hoping that you, well, you should, if it's done well, get even distribution of say alcohol consumption, smoking, mm-hmm. uh, body weight, blah, blah, blah. Yes. But we're, with an observational study. You which don't do that. You don't do that. Yes. So the main, the main difference, so randomizations benefit is that there is an assumption that unknown covariates are equally distributed between groups. That's the Mm -hmm. real methodological, scientific kind of supposed beauty of randomization. Mm -hmm. If it's a known covariate, smoking, body weight, then there are methods with randomization to make sure that you have equal distribution Mm -hmm. of those between groups. So you have the same number of men and women, the same levels of BMI in both groups, the same baseline levels of, of education education and otherwise sure. but the assumption of randomization that makes people comfortable with causal inference is that any unknown covariates that we don't know about yet are assumed to be equally distributed mm-hmm. between groups now in the context of epidemiology if there's unknown covariates in a randomized control trial they're still unknown in a population study right. now usually if it's been well conducted and you still have a significant association then people will say this generic throwaway term of, well, residual confounding Mm. cannot be ruled out. That's basically saying, look, stuff we don't know about could potentially be influencing the outcome. Mm. But because you can't randomize people in an observational study, statistical adjustment is what you use to achieve the same balance between Mm. groups, essentially, 
that you would with randomization. Right. But this is really important because if we've got prior knowledge that there are things that influence an outcome, we use that prior knowledge mm. well. A well-conducted cohort study conceptually can achieve the same thing if we know what those potential confounders are. They're defined. And we know for most of these outcomes we're interested in, smoking, diet, uh, alcohol mm. intake, education status, like family history of disease, you'd want to be thinking of something pretty niche. But this is a great point because on Twitter, you often see people say, well, if it's an observational study that someone shared with a great multivariate analysis, yeah, yeah, yeah. really the, the, the researchers were well aware of like yeah, confounding and, and adjusted yes. for it. They, they had a great surveys and data collection mm -hmm. so that they knew well-defined cohort mm -hmm. and people will still say, but confounding, but they won't put forward well, what, what the confounder what, is. Exactly. If, if you can't put one just forward, say residual if you can't put something yeah. forward, then it's probably not yeah, the greatest exactly. sort of line of thinking. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a, an enormous breakthrough to, to find out what this thing <laughs> that's influencing these outcomes is that we don't know about yet, right? And again, keeping scientific skepticism in place, right. there, there could maybe, be such maybe a it's thing. Maybe putting it's putting your phone in your pocket. <laughs> right? But as far as these health outcomes we're interested in, We've got our red meat as our exposure, for example, and we've got heart disease as our outcome. What these analyses do in epidemiology is they look at, do different categories of a potential confounder influence that association? So into your model goes, well, let's take smoking is the potential confounder, and we'll divide people into less than 10 cigarettes a day, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. And we'll look at whether any of those levels influence the outcome or the association. And what you'll typically find is they'll have different models, right? And all a model is, is what's been included in that analysis, mm -hmm. essentially. And it's called a model because of regression ultimately is a, is a mathematical <laughs> equation. But you'll usually have, say, a model one, which just adjusts for like sex, BMI, and age. And then they might have a second model where they add a couple of other things. So this is allowing you to actually see how that changes over time. Almost uniformly, model mm -hmm. one's risk estimate will be really high. Right. And then it comes down and as further things are adjusted that for. that person who was consuming more red, red meat in model one also was smoke also alcohol, and smoking, alcohol. blah, blah, blah. So what you tend to get to is by model maybe three or depending on the analysis four or five, whichever it is, if by the time we get there and we still have a statistically significant risk estimate where the confidence intervals are at such a kind of spread that they're not too close to it being insignificant, then you've got to explain, let's say there's a 30%, the hazard ratio is like 1.30, right? You have a 30% relative risk increase of this outcome. And the confidence intervals are 1.21 to say 1.36. So 21% mm -hmm. to 36%. If someone's going to argue for residual confounding, they're going to have to argue that some factor we don't know about explains 21%. Yeah. Right. Of a risk. Make sure you put this in the ebook that's going to solve all the misinformation. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so, so what I say about the unprocessed red meat stuff is a lot of, we have a lot of really good cohort studies that are well executed and they've well adjusted for these factors. Typically, if the intake of unprocessed red meat is less than 100 grams a day, we don't typically see any associations with heart disease cancer or otherwise. What's 100 grams of red meat, do you think, to sort of eyeball? Is that Very like small. a deck of cards? It's, or it's a probably a, just a palm. Yeah, I'd It's say probably okay. just a palm. And then when we start to look at like these thresholds, when you find studies where the top group is over about 150, 60 grams a day compared to lower intake, then you do see risk emerge mm -hmm. and you do see it statistically significant and you do see fairly robust confidence intervals and you do see its surviving adjustment for all of these various levels of these covariates. And more importantly, you see it in different populations. Now, the popular study that people love to cite is this cohort study that came out of Canada, which was a really, really nice, well thought through way of analyzing this. And it said, well, look, there's a difference between including something just as a covariate in your model versus actually specifically modeling how your exposure relates to the outcome at different levels. So actually almost like a direct comparison at different levels of intake. So that's your primary comparison here is red meat at this level of fruit and veg, this level of fruit and veg, this level, low, medium, high. 
And what they did was they looked at that for processed and unprocessed meat. What people overlook in that study was processed meat was pretty much associated independent of your right. fruit and vegetable intake. So that's mm-hmm. that's another nail in the coffin for processed meat. So you can't offset it with a healthy You can't meat. offset yeah. it. Does bacon fall into that category? Yeah, pro- anything that's salted, cured, dried. I've seen people kind of questioning that on social media that not all bacon is ultra processed. Yeah, I've heard that too. Uh, so, so apparently there's bacon that's like nitrate free. Right. It's a big marketing thing in America. I don't know enough about okay. it, if I'm honest. Yeah. But, but importantly in that study, when it came to the unprocessed red meat, yes, what they showed was that the unprocessed red meat in the low vegetable category, there was a significant increase in risk. But in the highest vegetable category, fruit and veg intake, that was abolished. Mm. Now, what people have misinterpreted is the exposure in that study relative to the dose thresholds that I've just described. Because the, what they did in that study was not look at daily intake. They looked at weekly intake. Mm-hmm. The highest group in that cohort consumed around 460 grams a week not a day. Mm. Do the maths here. So they're under that This threshold. is average. It's about 65 grams a day. Mm. Right. The World Cancer Research Fund recommendation for unprocessed meat is 500 grams a week as a limit okay. at the top. And all of the other analyses that we have, Epic Oxford, the other US cohorts, and some of the other Epic subgroups, again, all when they're less than that threshold. So, so there's nothing particularly surprising about mm. this finding. And it's being misinterpreted to suggest that a high red meat intake. It's relative. It's re- this was weekly categorization right. of red meat intake. So the actual highest level of intake in this group was still completely congruent yes. with both the, w, yes. were, you know, the WCRF's recommendations and the wider research showing that at less than 100 grams a day with high fruit. So... For me, this finding just kind of corroborated right, that right. at these lower levels of intake, you know, some modest red meat, unprocessed red meat right. intake with a wider healthy diet yes. is probably not going to What does it say the about risk. the fact that with the, even just in this study, I know that, that you made the threshold point really clear, but what does it say about the fact that as with increasing amounts of fruit and vegetable, the risk went away? Is it that red meat is not as deleterious like are the, are the fruits and vegetables actually interacting with the red meat Possibly. or is it that the fruits and Possibly. vegetables are inherently beneficial and just as you eat more right. i would say both based on kate bingham's research um the metabolic ward studies on like high red meat intake unprocessed red meat intake that looked at like you know carcinogenic processes attenuating factors so when i look at that i kind of think it's both mm. okay i think is it, are they looking at it in the same meal, like in a, in a, in a sitting? Because if you ate red meat on its own, because I'm wondering if, if literally like it interacts in the gut where like the fiber locks there's, or antioxidants. There's, or there's, antioxidants. there's potential for that as so far as it might relate to the actual production of carcinogens in the first place. Yeah. Where a lot of the compounds that we would mm. find in fruits and vegetables kind of essentially prevent that process. Mm. I think um, most people would be having mixed meals. Mixed meals. Mixed meals. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. So, so the short answer is, I think okay. it's both. I think that at that level of intake, it's possibly Kate Bingham's research had to use like 400 grams a day of unprocessed red meat to kind of show these like the carcinogenic mm-hmm. kind of processes. And that was in the context of feeding people fruit and vegetable and, and not or, or fiber mm-hmm. added. So I just think if someone's consuming an average of like 70 grams a day, it's probably okay. also just not enough of, an, of a level of intake mm. to create, mm. to generate enough of these right. adverse effects. So to challenge the current recommendations, mm-hmm. you would need to see some data that shows, say, north of 100 or 150 grams a day average and with a healthy diet around that, there's no effect on say cardiovascular disease that would be the data that would get you thinking oh, okay maybe there's something here yeah and i haven't seen that yet so i think for processed re- red meat intake i think for processed meat the data is pretty clear and unequivocal mm. i think for unprocessed red meat intake i think it's just a nuanced answer to the question and that doesn't work well when you've one crowd that want to just be like epidemiology is bullshit, just eat fruits and vegetables and eat red meat versus people saying, well, it's just inherently harmful. So what I'm seeing a lot, particularly in the social media conversation, is kind of abuse of a concept. I don't think it's willful, but it's this concept of compared to what? Mm. Compared to what as a statistical approach creates additional assumptions for how you interpret that 
So what, um, what's happening on kind of in the wider conversation is that people are interpreting it as if it's just a straight food swap because that's how it reads. Oh, well, isocaloric replacement of 5% of energy from red meat with, you know, legumes or plant protein was associated. Okay, so people are then interpreting that as that's, that's just a f straight food swap, mm -hmm. right? It's not. Unless whatever's been adjusted for in that model is probably not the totality of diet. So what that regression model actually is, is it's that replacement in the context of the wider dietary pattern mm -hmm. that is unadjusted for. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. And that then comes back to the characteristics in that cohort. Mm -hmm.